Hello, it's Jake here, and welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a discussion of Murray Rothbard's book, For a New Liberty, and our special guest is Stefan Molyneux of Free Domain Radio. The reason that we chose this book is really because for those of us who are applying the principles of voluntarism in our own lives, we're all really recovering statists to some extent. You know, we're surrounded by people who are addicted to using coercion because at least for most of us, that's really the way that that everyone is brought up. And also because, you know, we are all brought up with the illusion that the state is at least necessary, if not good. So the interesting thing about Murray Rothbard is that he is one of the most consistent anarchists in history, really. And his critique of the state is very interesting for those of us who are overcoming statism and who are applying the non-aggression principle consistently. So before we get into the discussion, uh, I'll give just a brief background to Murray Rothbard uh, and the book, what I know about him. Rothbard was an academic economist of the Austrian school, and he's actually the the man who created the term anarcho-capitalism. He was the main figure responsible for linking anarchism with free market economics in the 20th century. He was born in the 1920s in New York, His parents were Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, and he said about his upbringing that he grew up in a communist culture. He went to university in New York, and he took part in seminars by Ludwig von Mises, and that's where he got his uh, introduction to sort of the Austrian school um, economics approach. He actually had contact with the Ayn Rand circle for a while, although these two great thinkers fell out with each other. And I think it's interesting that one of the reasons that they fell out was that they actually called each other on the contradictions that they had as thinkers. So although Murray Rothbard was an atheist, he married a very religious woman. And Rand called him out on this contradiction. And although Rand was um, against coercion, she was a minarchist, and Murray Rothbard called her out on that uh, contradiction. And he also wrote a scathing parody of Rand's cliqueiness and her need for adoration. In the 50s and 60s, he worked for the William Volcker Fund, which was a think tank, and he wrote Man, Economy and State, which is his big treatise in free market economics. And from the mid-60s to the mid-80s, he worked at Brooklyn Polytechnic as an academic. And he was a libertarian activist um, at this time, taking part in many of the organizations of the start of the sort of libertarian movement in the States. And during, this was during this time um, in the early 70s that he wrote For a New Liberty. It's the only book that he actually got a commercial publishing contract for. And it was supposed to be a political manifesto for the new libertarian party that was just starting. But he actually went further than small government libertarianism to advocate full anarchy in this book. So the book starts with a history of the libertarian movement, and it sort of highlights uh, the origins of ideas of liberty in the Enlightenment and in the growth of free markets. And he spends a lot of time talking about the American Revolution and the importance of it as he sees it. It then goes through and outlines the principles of libertarianism, the non-aggression principle, and other sort of core ideas. And then he goes to apply, he goes on to apply these principles to a whole range of political issues, from taxes to wars to the welfare state, poverty, and so forth. And finally, he ends the book with his own ideas for political action. After he wrote For a New Liberty, he continued writing on subjects ranging from the Great Depression, money, and the ethics of liberty, and so forth. And he was further involved in the libertarian movement throughout his life. He was one of the people instrumental in setting up the Mises Institute. In the mid-1980s, he got his first professorship at the University of Las Vegas, and he stayed there until he died in 1995. And I think it's interesting to just look briefly at his character, One of the things that strikes me about Murray Rothbard is that he lived during really the high point of sort of collectivist ideology. Although the state wasn't bigger then, the ideas of communism and socialism were probably at their most popular during his lifetime. And I get 
the sense that he, within his chosen career as an academic and a political activist, he was quite isolated. He fell out with a lot of minarchists in his time, and he struggled as an academic. And he actually remarked that, you know, although it was a lot less consistent than his approach, um, Noizik's book, Anarchy, State and Utopia, was far better known um, during his lifetime as, you know, the sort of, as a writer on anarchy than Murray Rothbard was. And I think he found that difficult to see, you know, um, a much sort of less, less structured approach to anarchy becoming that bit more famous than he was. Um, as a person, a lot of people talk about how prolific a writer he was and how many different subjects he wrote about. But I think it's interesting to note that he also was a, a person with some significant neuroses. He was a very poor sleeper and he had a terrible fear of heights. So although he lived in New York City, he was actually afraid to go up skyscrapers. And his experience of New York was probably totally different because he, he tried to stay at ground level. He was also known as a very good humoured and witty person. And one of the stories that I remember hearing about him um, from one of the Mises um, podcasts was about a libertarian drinks reception that took place on the top of the World Trade Center towers. And he apparently thought this was an important thing to try and go to, even though he was terribly afraid of heights. So he didn't show up until halfway through the event when the doors opened to the lift and, and Rothbard emerged completely covered in sweat and obviously like really freaked out by being up that high. And he says to everyone, comrades, I bring you greetings from planet Earth, which I thought was quite, you know, quite good humor of him uh, under the circumstances. So I think he's a really interesting writer for those of us who are interested in really looking at the non-aggression principle seriously as a framework for our own lives. But he is somebody who also has some important contradictions of his own, especially in his ideas about political action. And we do get into that in, in the discussion that you're about to hear. So that's the intro. I hope that was useful. And I hope you enjoy the discussion. And thanks so much for listening. And on to the discussion. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. How exciting is that? We're talking about For a New Liberty by Murray Rothbard. There isn't really any set way of doing this. We're just going to have a chat. So if you have any thoughts um, and, or questions or insights about the book, then uh, just jump in. There's some slightly odd stuff in there about history. Like he says some stuff about how he thinks the, um, the early American Republic was this great libertarian you know, thing. And, and Greg G pointed out, that he has this idea that the Democrats, I believe Jefferson and these people, that they were going to do all this good stuff and they had this 40-year plan and somehow, you know, uh, he ignores the fact that they were actually politicians. If only right? the Whigs hadn't come about or whatever. And he also has some other funny history stuff about Europe where he says that the, the, the church, because the Catholic church wasn't the state church, it could provide some type of balance or some, something. So there's some funny history stuff, but just to make the point, you know, pulling the camera out, big picture, right? This is a book written in the 1970s that in many ways, like of all the millions of books out there, this one has got such a clear exposition of a lot of the most fundamental principles of libertarianism, right? Yeah, and not only the principles, but a little <laughs> bit of how things would work. Right, and, and so in the grand scheme of things, I think this is a pretty good book. I mean, it actually, um, a lot of the stuff that we talk about on Freedom Main Radio, you know, this book, you could read, you could read or listen to lots of it, and none of it would seem like it's all off message with really principled, a really principled approach to freedom. Of course, one of the things in the book that's, that's really a strange contradiction is that he does seem to be into politics, party politics and voting and the libertarian party and the whole idea of participating in, in the state when he at the same time clearly makes the argument in this book that he says, this is the one which has like this famous quote from him where he says, if you're confused about what the state is, just think of the state as a, as a body of a gang of, uh, of, a gang of thugs and then all the libertarian uh, positions will fall clearly into place and you'll understand what we think the state is. And so, you know, he's basically saying, like, the state is just a gang of thugs. 
and nothing the state does is legitimate. And he goes through all the different sectors and says, like, why not only will it not work in some practical terms, but why it's morally wrong. And he makes that argument. And he has this strange contradiction, which is that he also then says, you know, you should support particular tax cuts by politicians and you should support voting for libertarians. So I don't, you know, I think that is completely contradictory, but I don't know. He comes pretty close to, to, to being a pretty principled guy on a lot of levels, I think. Well, I mean, that's sort of, Steph's made this case as well. That's what makes it so insidious, right? I mean, um, he probably does the best job of all of obfuscating the fact that um, uh, the state is um, evil and that no, there is no such thing as a necessary evil, right? Like, if you're going to lay out the case, like Rothbard does in this book, step by step by step, of why a state is a really bad idea for organizing society, but then at the same time saying, well, we can't get rid of it, so we need to manage it, right? Oh, no, uh, Greg, he does not say we can't get rid of it. There's nowhere in this book that he says we can't get rid of the state. In fact, he says the opposite. He says, just like slavery, you should call for the immediate um, abandonment of everything to do with the state, even if, in practical terms, you don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. He says everything the state does is like a body of thugs, and every it's all wrong. Does he call for the abolishment of the state, though? Well... Does he call for anarchism in his book? Yes, yes he does. Oh, he does. See, I thought he was trying to make the case for basically libertarian government. No, and no, that's, he's making the that, case for anarchy. Oh. That's, he, that's what's so radical about the book. He was asked to do a book which was called The Libertarian Manifesto, but the joke of it is it's actually a manifesto for anarchy, for no government. Yeah, see, the, reading the first chapter, the first couple of chapters, I, I was left with the impression that he was asking for uh, or making the case for um, some form of l limited government, like whatever nope. the ideal in his mind was of government uh, as it stood in, say, 1777. No, not in any way. He's not making that case. Murray Rothbard coined the term anarcho-capitalist. I became an anarchist through listening to this stuff. Not specifically this book. Yeah, was it but, for the power market? Or was no, it, it, was a, it was actually, it was something on Free Talk Live that okay. actually flipped me over. But the point is, I was listening to this, this to stuff that was influenced, because he, because Murray Rothbard was the main guy, basically. So all yeah. the other ones were influenced by him. Sure. So I became an anarchist through this. I, I just like to add, uh, agreeing with Jake, that one of the reasons I came on to this conversation was this book, made a big, big difference for me. And it, it also moved me much closer towards voluntarism and anarchism. Um, this book was probably the first time I heard of Spooner. Then I read Spooner, some of Spooner's stuff. And then I started talking to people. I was involved in the party at the time, and I started talking about stuff with people and started realizing they weren't, going with me on this, you know, and how it was just totally, you could just totally, totally see a, a rift coming along. And I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense. And then Rothbard puts in his book too, if he, if I remember right, and I really haven't read the, I read the book more than once, but I haven't read it like just right before coming here, but I've got dog ears and all, all kinds of things through it. But if I remember right, the thing that I heard from him when he was, uh, when I was reading the book, was if anyone ever thought they were going to do anything politically, it would be a purely educational campaign, which is the only thing that I had ever gotten involved with in the first place. But then after I got thinking about it more, then I started realizing that that wasn't even it, too. And I just wanted to jump in here and say that this book was a big part of that thought process continuing. I noticed a lot of people do some thinking and they might go to a party outside of the 
two major parties. And then once they find that party, then they stop because they think they've found the answer. And then there's some people who keep digging after that and then they move even further. And books like this help that happen. Well, just, just to jump in and, um, and follow up on what Debbie was just saying. Uh, I mean, Murray Rothbard, not this particular book, but Power and Market, which was the banned part of his massive tome. Uh, that Power power and Market, um, I read that after listening to a little bit of Steph's podcasts, and he quoted Murray Rothbard once or twice, so I, I ordered that from Mises.org, and that, reading that first chapter of that is what finally tipped me to the part where I could clearly say, yeah, I'm an anarchist or anarcho-capitalist. Uh, it was when he made the point in, in a particular paragraph about uh, that a, 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 an organization that purports to protect your property by violating your property rights, like just pointing out that flat contradiction, and that was kind of what I needed. So just to toss it in my own personal experience of Murray Rothbard was the, the tipping point for me. Right. And I think, um, you know, I certainly think that Murray Rothbard, um, I read a, a very interesting book called uh, It Usually Begins with Ayn Rand, which is a description of all these characters in the sort of like 50s, 60s and 70s, or maybe 60s and 70s, like Murray Rothbard and Ayn Rand, and this guy who was involved in the libertarian movement, right, and he was sort of seeing all these people. And, you know, it's the same with Ayn Rand, you know, she, she clearly had some really wacky ideas. Some of her ideas were very odd and things went a bit strange um, in terms of her sort of social circle. But nonetheless, she, you know, she was incredibly important and made incredible steps. And Rothbard was actually more consistent than Ayn Rand in many ways, because he actually was an anarchist and he was an, an, a fully stated anarchist. It's just that he, as far as I understand, he had lots of ideas about linking up with disaffected political movements like and people who were against the Vietnam War but weren't necessarily libertarian or people who had all these other potentially anti-state ideas. And he thought that you could just kind of, in a sense, build this like broad front of people who would then get interested through political activism right i heard that made that argument made at philadelphia the delaware valley um voluntarist group they they made that point that they were going to go to an anti-war rally and try to get some people there then they were going to go try to go to a conservative tea party rally and get some people right. there for the economic side of things and it's all very like Let's try to branch out and try to make as big as big of a group of a circle of friends as possible. And and Rothbard in this book, he starts off. You remember the first chapter? He's like, "Oh, isn't it exciting that the Libertarian Party's got X votes and this, that, and the other?" Right. Right. And as far as I'm concerned, that was an experiment. Rothbard was a really good speech maker, and he tried it. So thanks a lot, because we don't have to, because it failed, right? And it doesn't work. Doing the whole opportunism thing is not only morally wrong, but it basically clearly didn't achieve the objectives. Because, you know, although there is the Mises Institute, Rothbard in that book is saying, oh, isn't it great? You know, only a couple of years from now and we'll have a big libertarian movement. And, you know, it's, it's still a totally fringe thing. Well, and that's something I wanted to bring up to this, this book club, which is that in chapter 15, the last one, which is the one that I listened to you this morning, Jake, uh, listened to with you this morning. Um, he <laughs> the one about the strategy for liberty. He states pretty clearly that he thinks it's about twenty years away. That was forty years ago. So yeah. I was kind of. I think it'd be useful to do a quick post mortem analysis because, uh, as Steph has discussed in Practical Anarchy, I mean, if this is a business venture and they have a project plan for this is our business plan, this is our three year growth projection. And not only did the business not grow, but it lost millions of dollars. We would do a post mortem and be like, "What the fuck happened?" So I think, what basically what the fuck happened from Murray Rothbard's um, strategy? What went wrong, and why is that? Yes. No, I think that's a good thing for us to talk about. But um, but just before we do sort of go into that, I was I was thinking um, it would be really interesting to hear like from other people on the call who've also read the book. You know. What were your thoughts and what do you think about this sort of debate that we've been having? Well, maybe I could take the micro microphone. I, um, for me, the, the, the discussion about uh, American history 
it's not so interesting because I'm I'm a German and so I don't know much about uh, American history. And uh, so I, I'm looking on, uh, at this uh, from a European perspective. Um, but uh, I, I'd just like to say um, what I, how I experienced um, reading the book or hearing the book. I heard it twice and make, made some notes here. I, I found it very enlightening for me. And uh, that, although I have listened to Steph's podcast uh, very, very much, so maybe about 500 or 600. And so uh, the arguments and, uh, and the perspectives were not new to me, but I found um, his, um, his, um, his, his way of stating his arguments and and the concise conciseness, um, or, or that's probably wrong, but um, of his of the maybe of the chapter three, the state, I found this very powerful and and um, it was very clear and it had a moral fervor to it and. I really liked uh, uh, to to listen to him, and I, I found it very convincing. And I was amazed that um, a book that uh, uh, is so old <laughs> um, uh, has already uh, these these arguments uh, in it, because I I thought um, um, because I, um, for me all these uh, these these per perspectives came from Steph. And so I thought this was all pretty new, because I'm I'm pretty new to the to the uh, political um, uh, discussion of of our an anarchy. So for me, it was it was also a huge uh, revelation to see that there is a a longer um, debate about the state and uh, as a longer uh, um, um, intellectual tradition uh, about anarchy. So I found this book, uh, uh, apart from these uh, political discussions, uh, maybe chapter 15 or 14, uh, these are I didn't uh, find found so appealing because, I mean, it's it's politics and that's 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 boring I think, um, but um, the the arguments for anarchy in the in the in the chapter two and three I I found very very uh, powerful. So that's my my thing. Cool. Thanks. That's really interesting to to hear. And uh, yeah, I know what you mean about the political bits. And I, I found myself, you know, when he's saying, you know, well, then Carter says this, and I was thinking, what Carter? I mean, this is like ancient, that was, that was ancient I, history. That was when you and I started to drift off a little bit. We, <laughs> yeah, we turned it off about five minutes till the end. But. Because um, it seems to me like um, he's Rothbard is a funny mixture between I, I know what you mean Heiko I think that the, he's a great writer and that many times when he's talking about the principles it's really clear and very very well written frankly just well the the logic is really clearly written but then he seems to get sort of you know excited by the kind of political gossip in a way you know of what's happening in America and oh, there's just been Watergate and maybe people now are going to change their minds. And now, like looking back on it, now that it's like 40 years later, you sort of, you can kind of see that that was all in a way trivial stuff that yeah. he sort of kind of really missed the point on, you know? Right, it's very yeah. dated. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, I think that's the, uh, the fate of, um, <laughs> of all thinkers. Um, uh, maybe not of all, but I mean, it, it, he was he was he was engaged in his in his time, and so maybe things uh, appear more important than than when we are looking back now. Yeah, right. and and that, in a sense, you know, that is really useful because we can basically we can look back and and say, well, there are really good things from this book, which is the sort of principal stuff. But you can see that all of the opportunistic stuff that he was doing to try and get the word out, his involvement in the Libertarian Party, and his, uh, his sort of um, saying that it's good to try and, you know, in a sense, but my understanding of his approach was basically education of people of Libertarian principles is going to be the way that things change. 
So just use any opportunity you can. If you can get in and like start, become a politician and win votes to be, you know, even to say, I think the state should be abolished, then go for it because it's another platform, right? He was sort of really into getting platforms. Yeah. And in that sense, he seems to have missed the point that he's saying the state is evil. And yet he's saying, why don't we just see if we can get a platform and maybe people will listen because there's an election, you know? And that just, so, um, <laughs> just seen James's joke. Well, it was the seventies about getting platforms. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he tried this opportunistic route, but because he missed out on the psychological side of why people don't, why these ideas don't take, take hold. Um, I think that was the big thing that was missing. I mean, like you were saying, Heiko, you know, it's, in a way, it's really sad to see that this is a book written in the early 1970s where it's all fucking there. It's all laid out, you know? I mean, basically, you, if you, anybody who, who has any sort of commitment to logic couldn't possibly, after listening to this book or reading this book, couldn't possibly b believe that a state was something that, that would be morally right or defensible in any way. And yet, here we are 40 years later, and we're in exactly the same place. In fact, actually, no, not was, in yeah, exactly the same place would be fine. We're actually behind a little bit. Yeah, that's right. The state has grown. And um, so, you know, I think that that shows that, like, that Steph's made the point that really saying that taxes are theft is not rocket science. You know, that should be something that people should understand very clearly. And Murray doesn't, in this book, he doesn't actually tackle the question, like, why aren't people getting this? He, he doesn't. He, the closest he gets to that would be in the, in the last chapter when he tries to, to take each demographic apart. And he's like, well, college-age students are more susceptible to this kind of stuff. Not susceptible. More open to this kind of stuff. Um, and also businessmen, maybe not so much. Businessmen. I think more into the system. He did make a good point about how businessmen are not the rational, perfect beacons of individualism that Ayn Rand makes them out to be because they're often getting a lot of state largesse. And... Yeah, because he says the thing about Ayn Rand saying that big business is the most persecuted minority. And he says, basically, are you kidding? Just look at Lockheed <laughs> Martin. They're basically <laughs> you know, sucking off the state, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, there's, and he makes the point, like, there's no point going to the CEO of Lockheed Martin and saying, what do you think about free market because that guy is is actually really a big fan of the state because he's getting lots of money but so you met, he says you know talk to people in a sense who aren't corrupted yet and he gives the example of college students college students middle class who would benefit right. from the uh, abolition of the state minorities who would be free to further their own group goals without the whole the right state. right but he but i but he misses psychology. He does. Right? He does. And that is the big failing of the book, is that he doesn't address um, the, the issue of uh, why people are so against libertarianism. I, I wonder um, if at the time, like, and of course, not reading the book and, and not having lived there, at the time of writing the book, was it was there a sense that it had been an absolute failure like how long it's just you know completely completely ignorant with the history here but how long had libertarian ideas and, and anarchism been floating around uh that he could even say 20 years was a reasonable estimate well he sort of goes through the history um in the book and you know i mean he makes the point that the basically libertarianism is what the whole enlightenment was about it was about um you know essentially removing state shackles on people's behavior both in the marketplace and also in scientific understanding and state and religious shackles and but he sort of he just sort of makes the point that there are there were people in the 19th century who were making um, libertarian arguments and there's sort of Lysander Spooner and all these types of people. So the ideas have been around for ages. 
Um, and he does make the point, although he sort of like pops it in there slightly as a side point that the fatal flaw of the American Revolution was slavery. And it's like, um, hang on a minute, because <laughs> so, it's kind of like they were so libertarian, but they had slavery. So I think he, <laughs> I think right. he likes to he, he, I think he wants to he wants to have his cast of heroes from history. He has a mythology going. Yeah, he's got he a mythology to. going, yeah. yeah, which is that there were all these great guys where he sort of misses the point that, you know, um, yeah, they were slave owners. They own people. Yeah, they own people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, and, and also, I, I think he does make a good point, although I'm not sure that it's a valid point, but it's a good point as far as, like, it, it it's truthy, as Stephen Colbert would say. Like, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds kind of true. And I, I don't know about the validity of it, but he does say that, like, people wouldn't have ever guessed that classical liberalism would have taken hold until, and it kind of suddenly did after the American Revolution. <laughs> and he said in a similar sense, that's how anarchism will be. And that's why a 20 year time frame maybe isn't so radical because the American Revolution was pretty fast as well. But I don't think that that's entirely true thinking on it though, because the ideas had kind of been growing for at least, a, I don't know, a century. Uh, and I think he's Thomas Paine and all the writers before him. Yeah, and, and like although I haven't read Lysander Spooner, so I'm not sure exactly quite how what he did or whatever. But certainly, at least my understanding, and this may be misreading of it, but my understanding is that this guy Murray Rothbard was one of the first ones to be clearly both an anarchist and a proponent of, in essentially free market capitalist progress or, you know, like commerce and trade and stuff. Because I think some of these 19th century anarchists were more like, let's go and sit in the woods type anarchists. They, right? They're considered in the individualist anarchist right. camp, which is very close to the, the anarcho-capitalism, but not quite in the... But as far as I understand, you, you can tell me if this is totally wrong, but like, I think Thoreau is Thoreau, one of these yeah. guys. And he did go and sit in the woods, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> so basically, his solution, I think, was... This world's all fucked up. I'm going to go and sit in the woods. You know? And of course, you know, as a solution, that's like, well, thanks, but you know, I don't fancy sitting in the woods. Like, I quite like to trade and have activity. With no, people. that having been said, I do think that um, someone like um, Sandra Spooner would have gotten along brilliantly with Murray Rothbard. And I think after, like, I think a century later, they would have both considered themselves anarcho-capitalists. Right. I think... Well, because Lysander Spooner did also do things like start a post. He started service. his own postal service that was then shut down by the government. And so that sounds more like really somebody who was up for the market yeah, and for interaction and for people to be able to have, you know, commerce, trade, interaction with each other, as well as being individualist. Because, like... It's the individualists who have to go and live in the woods seem like a bit of a sad bunch, basically. Cause... Yeah, well, and, and I mean, and like, I think uh, Lysander Spooner does a great job, and uh, I mentioned this earlier as a book that we should do in the Freedom Book Club, in, in No Treason, of um, just a scathing critique of the, of the uh, Constitution as not about liberty at all. Right. It's not a contract, right? Is that the, the that's, that's a part of it, right? That's part of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, are you sure that he was an opportunist? I uh, had uh, the feeling that he was condemning uh, the opportunist uh, viewpoint. Like when he was saying that keeping a law alive for some period of time and cutting tax in a one year by 10% or, or so on and so on, if this is not argument against opportunism yes i think you're absolutely right i mean just to be clear i think he's actually even though he makes some some arguments which i don't i think are a bit contradictory and that his argument about opportunism opportunism was quite principled in a way because what he says is look denying the end goal of libertarianism which is essentially anarchy is in order to get along with people who agree with some parts of the way, that is an opportunity that is unprincipled. And he does make that argument. Like, so for example, somebody who pretends not to be in favor of the abolition of all state controls in, in every respect, but just says like, well, this state control is really bad. And, we, you know, let's, let's get rid of this. Even if we accept these other state controls, he says that's 
That's he he a, calls them rhetorical flourishes, and he says, yeah, he are, says, don't don't, don't do that because do that. that's unprincipled. And he also says, don't support a tax cut if it's linked to like, well, we'll reduce taxes here, okay. but we'll also increase a couple of other taxes somewhere else. He says that is unprincipled because we should never agree with anything that gives um, additional like revenue to the state, basically. What he doesn't do, and, and the thing that, that we're, in a sense, the thing we're talking about here, which is the opportunistic part, is that what he doesn't do is say, look, participating in voting and in the state itself is kind of stupid because that's actually what you disagree with. I mean, that's actually unprincipled and wrong. He says, you know, that I think his, he doesn't make, I can't remember if he makes his argument in this book, but he, I know he was in favor of the idea that you could vote in self-defense, that it would be an he argument. He didn't make that in this book. I think he made it in um, maybe The Ethics of Liberty yeah. or in other books. He's definitely made... He, He's like, if he you was, find yourself stuck in a status system and, and they're going to right, yeah. and they're gonna impose some big tax, then sure, you can vote against it as self-defense. Like, mm -hmm. And that, I think, is really a very... For somebody who's against the state, that's a very contradictory argument. And it's, it's a rhetorical flourish because it's very, yeah. it's very convincing. For like for a second there, I even found myself <laughs> thinking, well, maybe he has a point. But yeah, I'm far from that point. So I think I view that more like a desperate uh, solution. So like, let's not vote. <laughs> like, what else can we do? Just vote against at least this one. Like what you said about uh, the voting uh, against some huge tax law, uh, I view that like this is only desperation. Like he's feeling desperate that at least we can postpone the total enslavement by taxation. Like at least we can do something. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, in a sense. Like, you could make the argument that, um, you know, if you're being, if some guy is um, is saying to you, I'm going to steal your money unless you beg me not to, I think Rothbard's argument would be like, hey, nothing wrong with begging because, uh, you know, you're, the guy's got holding a gun to you, right? And in a sense, that's exactly what voting is. Like, begging the state not to do X, Y, and Z, assuming that they, you know, in a sense, appealing to the appealing to the conscience of the people who run the state to actually read this piece of paper vote and think, oh, okay, well, if you don't want me to, then I won't. You know, it, this is, it's a sense, it's like begging, right? Well, but except for the, the very important fact that when you vote, unless you're voting for an anarchist, an anarchist who's somehow on the ballot, like, unless you're voting for, like, a Mary Ruart type fellow um, on the ballot, you're voting for violence towards someone else. So in a sense, that's almost like, beg, and yeah. then I'll shoot someone else instead yeah, of Yeah, please you. don't hit me, hit right. somebody else instead. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's getting into yeah, if you're if Completely you're unprincipled. But, um, yeah. Yeah, you're right, because in a sense, like, it doesn't make sense, because you can't just vote against a tax law. You have to vote for... You Unless it's like a referendum, you actually have to vote for a politician. Right. Mm -hmm. So even if you're voting for Ron Paul, who's like a very libertarian guy in many ways, you're still voting for, because Ron Paul is very pro, um, or very anti-immigration, right? So you're... Yeah, it's a package deal. So as, as uh, actually, Wendy McElroy makes a very good point that said, would you sign a piece of paper that said, I support this anti-immigration policy of Ron Paul's? And would you sign your name on that? And if you wouldn't do that, then you have no business voting for Ron Paul. In fact, the funny thing is that um, this is where uh, Murray Rothbard doesn't make any sense, because he says you shouldn't vote for a tax cut if there's a tax increase associated with it. But every time you vote for a politician, that's exactly what you're doing. Unless you've got an anarchist on the ballot, which is, like, never going to happen. Right. Well, it wouldn't be... And by definition... Yeah, right. by definition, they can't be an anarchist if they believe in, in becoming a politician. But this is kind of the problem with libertarianism as a whole, is it, it kind of goes so far and then chickens out. Yeah. Absolutely. And, I mean, compared to 
for example, um, Ayn Rand, who was really up for the politicians, right? She was like a committed fan of voting and everything else, right? Oh, she was a huge, not, not just a... <laughs> well, of the state too, right? Well, like, Ayn Rand wasn't just a, oh, regretfully, I will vote for Barry Goldwater. She, like, actively campaigned for Barry Goldwater. Yeah. Right? Murray Rothbard goes further in that he's saying, like, basically, this is all a load of crap. We should get rid of the state. However, maybe tactically, I can get some no, speeches no. done if I do, if I, you know, get on the vote and so forth. Right. I think that's a good point about the like if you're voting for a politician you can't just vote against, against the tax right you're yeah. voting for a politician right. you're voting for other policies that as good as ron paul is on many issues just his immigration alone let alone his other policies lead him to be totally you're voting for statist policies yeah i um i just wanted to add on thinking i was thinking about this book because i know like there are some books that there, uh, there was actually an article in Free Talk Live, and I don't even know who did it, that I heard, which really tipped me over to being an anarchist. But this book has some great arguments that really clarified things in my mind. So, for example, free speech, right? I mean, one of the things that, um, that he talks about in this is, you know, what is the sorts of um, principled approach to the question of free speech? Because... When you, before you kind of really think through the principles, you sort of think, well, I mean, free speech is good because you should be able to say what you like, but because you don't want to control people. But then, uh, what is, is that the same as marching down the street? And, you know, can, should anybody be allowed to say anything anywhere? And basically, he makes... Shouting fire in a public theater. Well, right. And he makes the point that these are all completely non-problems as right. soon as you apply the principle of property rights, because then it becomes, well... Is it free speech if you're saying it in my house or in your house? And, you know, if, frankly, if you are in my house, then... And I start calling you names right, and swearing you at you. You don't have free speech because I set the rules here, right? So right. I can tell you that, you know, I don't want you to say the word, you know, apple in this house because that's my big thing or whatever. The point being that, <laughs> right. that um, there's, there's actually a principle which, which shows what free speech is and what it isn't. Right, right. And the other thing is um, that he talks about the issue of, um, you know, the, the only way to have free speech is actually if there are people who have the freedom to own their own, you know, internet connections, or he doesn't say that because it's in the 70s, but he says printing presses and stuff like that. So the point being, like, you're free to say what you want only if you have the means to say it, like the means to communicate without somebody else. And that's a property issue. That's about... Being, ha having the right, sort of being unimpeded in having people around your house that you can say things to or in having a printing press or whatever. Well, and that's actually um, something that Steph has run into with banning people on the boards because people often conflate free speech with, and they don't see the property rights behind it. So they see that, <laughs> oh, you're a libertarian, you should agree with free speech as I have the right to, to slander you on your own website. Whereas Steph takes the more, and I think justly so, the property right approach of, I own this server, I own this property of this message board, I can damn well do whatever I want on it, and you're not allowed to say this stuff on this site. Yeah, and I, I read this book some, like, maybe four, four years ago or something, but it was this book that actually verified that point for me. Right. That's a good point to make, yeah. And, and not to bring it to another book, but he, um, in Ethics of Liberty, he makes some fairly radical claims about, say, uh, children and how children should at any age be allowed to leave their households if they don't like their parenting. And again, that starts with, with, with property rights, that even a child owns his own property. And yeah, so it, it's starting with the principle of property rights rather than, oh, but that makes me feel uncomfortable. So let's set an arbitrary age. Right? Yeah. Does anyone know if he had kids? I don't think so. He didn't have kids. I, 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 for some reason, I have no real evidence to back that up, but I don't think that he... I, don't think, I know he had a wife who was Christian, although he was anarchist. Um, which he, he was an atheist. Uh, atheist. He was an atheist, and actually his Christian wife was one of the reasons Ayn Rand didn't want him to be part of the collective. Right. Because that's irrational, you see. Sorry. 
if you <laughs> oh, if you've ever um, well if you've ever read his play uh, Mozart was a red or seen it performed it is so hilarious it's a uh, quite a scathing critique on Ayn Rand's uh, less rational aspects of her social life. Uh, yes, you've, you've pointed that one out to me before. I'd like to come back to a point uh, Jake made earlier, if that's all right. Yeah, I guess and, right. Okay. I was impressed, and, and this may, may, may be because I'm just not informed, <laughs> but I was impressed by his argument for property rights. I think he's, he goes through three alternatives, and uh, in the end, he he sides with the natural rights um, a concept of of property rights, and um, uh, he 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 states. Um, I have it here on on page twenty nine, and he he states that. Um, um, to in order to be to be a, a proper property right or a proper a proper ethical axiom uh, some uh, some uh, um, right has to be universal and uh, it, it's a, he says a right happy everyone by virtue of being a human being so he is also implying there that that um, it must be a principle that cannot be arbitrarily um, have exceptions. And I think that's, that's not UPB, but uh, it's, it comes a bit close to it. And it, it's, 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 I was, I was fascinated that uh, he, he went so far in, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 Naming some characteristics of a founding uh, ethical axiom. Uh, so, and having said this, I wanted to emphasize the point Jake made before. Um, I think this is very powerful, and this is very convincing, and it's it's very difficult to argue against uh, um, this as a utilitarianist or as an authoritarianist. And um, although he made it very clear, he, um, he wasn't very successful with it. Um, and so I, I think it's 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 a very important question. Uh, of course, um, why is that the case? And uh, I mean, Steph has its his uh, opinions about it, and um, uh, well, I agree with them. But I think um, it's the point is is uh, the question is is all the more important um, because I think he made um, the logical uh, arguments very strong. Right. Yeah. In other words, you know, you can't fault in sense in many senses you can't fault the logic. So there's got to be a good explanation um, as to why his um, his sort of um, strategy is such a total failure after 40 years um because although you know we've talked about some of the gaps and some of the sort of contradictions in general his ethical um background seems to me to be also uh, as, as Heiko was saying seems pretty good because he's saying basically um there has to be a basis in objective material fact about being a human being that defines what you understand to be ethics. You can't just um, make some shit up, basically. It's got to be based on, you know, the actual properties of the real world, which is basically another sort of way of saying Steph's uh, logic and empiricism. Well, and actually, Steph, or uh, Murray Rothbard's ethical approach is much closer to UPB than Ayn Rand's ethical yes. approach, which was much uh, the effects of it are, I mean, I don't disagree with any of her fundamental conclusions of her virtues that she's defined, but it's all based upon, like, life is the highest value and therefore anything that, I'm, I'm totally generalizing it, but therefore anything that promotes a man's individual life is the ethical good and anything that 
that goes against his life is the ethical bad. Uh, whereas Murray Rothbard takes a much more just universal objective principle approach that doesn't start with the premise of life as the highest ideal. Yeah. I would be really interested, and obviously it's all we could wish all we want and we're never going to hear it, but like I would be really interested when, when Murray Rothbard was in Ayn Rand's group for a while. I'd be interested to hear, because I'm sure they had some very lively debates on Oh, it. man, that would have been such a great place to be a fly on the wall, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have? Rothbard and Ayn Rand. Because you know head to head. Good. That would be so cool. That would, that, would, that would make a very cool um, play or, or uh, mock-up, have somebody play random. Oh, yeah, that's true. That would be a really cool play. The only problem is you kind of need somebody, you kind of need somebody to be making the, the case, which they both missed, which is about the importance of the psychological side. And yeah. in a, I guess Nathaniel Brandon would kind of do that. You'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to morph Nathaniel Brandon to being somebody who really understood it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the narrator. Uh, and I wonder how much that had to do with his ultimate leaving. Of, I know there was this story around, like, she wanted his wife. She said that he couldn't remain with his wife if she was going to be Catholic or whatever. And, the, and the, that all may be true, but I do wonder how much... The anarchism. Oh, I it. think it must have had something to do with it. Because the thing is, right, Murray Rothbard was a very good debater, right? And can you imagine if you're a minarchist and you're really attached to that view <coughs> and you've got <coughs> Murray Rothbard <coughs> making the case? Wow, that would be a toughie, you know? It would. So and I'm she sure was, after she a wasn't while, a shabby debater either. No. Right? So I'm sure after a while that she kind of said, you know, I can't be having this anymore. This guy's getting on my nerves, you know? Sure. This is the, this is the psychological bit that, um, that Rothbard missed, right? right? This is the, the whole point, is that he missed the whole... He doesn't... There's two things, two glaring omissions from this book um, that, that um, I think really are the things that Rothbard missed. One is... Why don't people understand the basic proposition that taxation is theft, right? Why do you need all this education? Because it's not rocket science, you know? And Rothbard just completely ignores that question. And the second thing that he completely ignores is, if the state's totally evil, how on earth can you get yourself all excited about the Libertarian Party, who are a political oh, party? Right. Well, in that last time... I, I would only... I would only like to offer one correction to to what you said just now, Jake. What's that? I would substitute the word avoid for ignore. Oh, you mean like he actively avoided these things? Sure. He's a smart man, right? And he was a, a student of society and of human social organization, right? So... It can't be that he didn't, at some level, know. In the same way that it can't be that Ayn Rand didn't, at some level, know. Right? Or wasn't, at some level, aware of these questions. Well, I think what's interesting is at the end of the book, he's talking about what demographics would be most receptive to these ideas. And we can talk about college students, we can talk about the middle class, et cetera, et cetera. But what I think he misses is that there's, from a purely intellectual and from a purely, like, if we were off in the distance looking down at Earth, there would be no one more receptive to anarchism than Ayn Rand, right? But as he saw, she didn't budge, right? Yeah, which that's would, a good point. Which, she was like a principled um, minarchist who was in free market. She wasn't taking state money. Right. So in a sense, there's, there's no, like, like, forget talking about the middle class and college kids only knowing about these ideas, because Ayn Rand probably had some debates with him and didn't sway, right? So it's, it's like, then yeah, that's his, uh, his evidence that it's not just about how receptive you're going to be based on where you're going in your life and all that kind of stuff, because... Well, no, I think, I think it's a, a really reasonable point that he makes when he says, look, somebody who's running a corporation is already basically corrupt because they are taking money from the state 
So don't expect them to, you know, turn around and become an anarchist and be anti-status, right? And he makes that point, which I think is a fair enough point, right? But you're right, he misses the point that, okay, well, if it's only about, in a sense, economic circumstances, then, as you say, Ayn Rand, look at her, she's in the free market, she's right Already books, agrees with you on 99 Already agrees with 90 Why on earth wouldn't she be up for the last 5%, right? Right. The last 5% are the hardest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, welcome, Steph. How are you doing? Oh, I'm great. Uh, thanks. Sorry. Just uh, we, were, we were at the zoo, so we're back. <laughs> <laughs> We've just been talking about um, For a New Liberty by Murray Rothbard. Uh, yes, very interesting book. And, um, well, I guess we've lots of people have had lots of thoughts about it. Did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably similar to what most people have, which is that it's 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 a good book. I mean, it's a great book, in my opinion. It's it's well worth the read. Um, at the same time, it has a kind of um, dry abstraction to it that is uh, is hard for me to connect to. And I get this uh, with the, the, the sort of Jeff Riddenback read, read books on libertarianism. Uh, I, I find that there is a kind of otherworldliness to them. And uh, uh, so that that's always been my challenge. I view them they're sort of akin to science fiction uh, stories in a way, and it's like, yeah, it'd be cool if, yeah, it'd be cool if, but um, uh, with no particular map on on how to get there, it's always seemed like another planet with no no shuttle route, if that makes any sense. But I've I've certainly really enjoyed his. Uh, I mean, I started reading his stuff long after I did all my DRO theory and so on, and I thought that there was some stuff that was missing in what he did. But um, uh, I'm sure he would read the same of mine and say, yeah, there's lots of stuff missing. From you. You're too whitey. So um, yeah, I thought it was a, a, a it's a book that's well worth reading, in my opinion. Yeah, we were talking about how, um, I mean, I think, I think it was Heiko was saying that it's kind of amazing that this is in the early 70s and there were these, you know, a lot of these uh, anarchist principles were, were being laid out, um, but that was like ages ago and what happened, you know? So we were talking, we were talking about sort of the lack of, uh, of, of impact in a sense and maybe the, um, the very academic nature of, of the uh, the way that it's presented could be part of that then again you know jeff riggenbach does have a, a role to play in that because he's got <laughs> such a such a hilarious <laughs> voice that i think if they had somebody else reading it it might i don't know it might sound different yeah no he's a uh, hi <laughs> it's just very uh, are you, know, you like... making fun of jeff riggenbach <laughs> i would <laughs> rather not hear that right now my lounge really, singer act is on hold, and I'm reading libertarian works. He, it sounds like he's about to say, do you suffer from bowel problems? Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for him to break out, you know, reading this book may cause right, rapid things that, <laughs> are things that could happen to your body and so on. <laughs> One thing we were talking about, Steph, was his uh, sort of his strategy that he laid out in the last couple of chapters. And he had sort of a, I guess, 10 to 20 year plan that we're going to have freedom in 20 years, and this is how it's going to get there. And uh, obviously that didn't shape out 40 years later, but I was curious, do you have any thoughts on his strategic approach of the last couple of chapters? Yeah, and I actually, yeah, just um, uh, a, a long time ago, I bought um, Charles Murray's What It Means to Be a Libertarian, I think it's called. I bought it on cassette tape because I'm addicted to the 1970s apparently as well. And he had the same thing, you know, here's how we're going to do it. You know, we're going to educate, there's going to be votes, we're going to get more and more people into politics and then those people are going to create environments which are more favorable to capital and people are going to want to move there and, you know, just slowly bit by bit, brick by brick, we're going to build through the political process to, uh, to achieve our goals. Uh, at least now, it's been a while since I've read Foreign New Liberty, but uh, was it was it similar, his his particular approach? Yeah, and it was something like if you can, if you are voting for, if you're voting against taxes, then that's good, but not if it's also voting for another tax, right? You don't want to yeah. compromise one tax at the expense of another, but it, it also... Yeah, but we, we were talking about how it doesn't really make a lot of sense because you can't just vote against a tax because there isn't like they don't do referendums on each little policy. You, you basically just vote guys in to do to, to do whatever it is that they, uh, you know, uh, uh, promise you that they're supposedly going to do. Right. And a vote for Ron Paul is a vote against immigration in a sense. And, and, also vote, and, right. and, and it's a vote for who knows what, because it's just some guy who says, yeah, I'll do X, Y, and Z, but 
I mean, who knows what the guy's going to do? Right. And th- here's this. Here's this really extraordinary thing about Rothbard because Rothbard in this book says, "Listen, if you want to understand what we think of the state, just think of them as a gang of thugs, and everything will fall into place." That's mm. what the state is, right? And he also says in this book, no state intervention of any kind is ever right. So he's right. saying, he, he makes the case for anarchy in this book. And then he does this thing with the history where he says, well, you know, these great libertarian guys like Jefferson and his mates, they had this plan and they were going to get in and one of them was going to get rid of this and the other one was going to get rid of that. And then something happened and they got off course and then they lost it and then this happened. And, and it's all like, wait a minute, you, you're talking about politicians and you're saying that these guys were going to do good stuff by, in a, by joining the states, you know, that they were going to dismantle it from the inside. And it just seems like such a blatant contradiction of what he's already said. And, he, and yet he does make that contradiction. Seems, like, hey, not seems, my good man, tis. Tis. Yeah. No, it is. It's a mad contradiction. And I have my sort of own theories as to why it ended up that way. But it is a mad contradiction. The state is inherently and innately evil by definition. It is a violation of property rights in the NAP. And so we need to make it do good things. I mean, that, that, is, that is mad, right? Yeah. We were saying earlier, by the way, Steph, that um, wouldn't it have been cool to be a fly on the wall in the uh, Ayn Rand, Murray Both- Rothbard debates about the state and anarchism and stuff? Because I think that would have been very interesting. Barry. Yeah, no, it would have been quite interesting. <laughs> I don't think anybody's voice is deep enough to do Ayn Rand's, except maybe Barry writes on quaaludes or something. But yeah, no, it would have been it would have been quite interesting. But I think it also would have been quite depressing in my. Yeah, you're right. Well, we read the the paragraph or two that she set out in in her books about how it's just gang warfare, and even if people were good, that you do need an objective set of laws. And, basically three sentences that that's for disproof of anarchism and it's like that would have been i think it would have been an interesting debate but i think ultimately yeah it would have been pretty sad because she didn't she didn't have any content in what she said and, and the story is that she kicked him out of their meetups because um his wife was a christian right which i'm sure you, you can see that that would be, would have been an issue but i bet you also i bet she got pissed off with having an anarchist who actually was quite a good debater you know, talking to her about her minicism because it would have really pointed out some uh, some of her own contradictions, you know? Right. So why why do you think that this, this kind of, why do people think this contradiction exists in these people who say, it's evil, it's evil, let's use it? Well, what we were saying earlier on is there's two things that um, he avoids in this book. One is the question, why is it that when it's not rocket science that taxes are theft, why is it that that's such a difficult argument to make? And he completely avoids that question. And the reason is because he totally avoids the psychology, the psychological side of it, which is about what is it that has happened to people that could get them to the point where, you know, stealing is wrong, taxes is stealing, taxes is wrong, is a difficult thing to understand, right? Right. And that, that, so he is absolutely avoiding the psychological side of it, or at least, you know, he's not tackling it. And, and presumably that must be because of his, his own personal life. You mean in terms of his wife, you think? Well, I'm guessing, I mean, he grew up in a, I was just looking at the wiki page, um, he grew up um, in a Jewish family who were communists, Right. Or at least he said he grew up in a communistic, um, there's a quote on Wikipedia or something about, I grew up in a communistic society or something. So he grew up in a Jewish family in New York who were apparently like socialists or communists or something like that. And presumably, you know, he maintained relations with his family. I mean, I know that a lot of the people who were around Iron Rands actually kind of de food but I don't think... Well, kind of, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, substitute one group for another, I thought. But right. anyway. And also, not in a principled way, just in, like, you know, having left Russia, so therefore <laughs> I can't see your parents <laughs> right. anymore. Type of well, thing. And, and also, <laughs> like, with, with Murray Rothbard, I think another point that could be made is that he... I mean, do you think he could have been as widely published and widely, like, 
basically as, as well known as he was if he had delved into the psychology of it. Because he was well funded by the Mises people. Uh, he had professorships, I assume. He was right. he got some grants to write his books. Uh, he was basically a well funded academic. You know, I don't think that's true. At least as far as I understand, he wasn't well funded for a long time. Or is that Mises? I can't remember. There is this is like you hear this when people from the Mises Institute do talks. Like they talk about how difficult it was for both Mises and Mises. Uh, was, it was tough for Mises. I've read his auto. I ordered his autobiography from the uh, institute, and it, he did have a pretty tough time of it. Well, Mises, right. his wife typed human action on a typewriter as sort of the draft copy they took to the publishers and stuff like that. Yeah. I think Rothbard had probably a little bit of an easier time because at least then the Mises... He definitely ended up in a university in Las Vegas, right? Yeah. And so, he had like a uni position somewhere. So, uh, uh, do you, so I mean, at the, and, at the, and at the time he wrote this book, he presumably had some people who were willing to publish him. So my point is, I mean, do you think if he had delved into a book about the psychology of it, no, I don't think that he was like, you know what, I'm not going to get into the psychology because of my career. I think it was more like his personal life, I'm guessing. Right, right. Oh, I don't think... But you be- wouldn't get in... If you're really career-oriented, you wouldn't get into anarchism at all. Right, right? exactly. I do think that's a, but there's a big difference between getting a bad professorship and getting no professorship, right? I mean, that, right. That's, that's a world, the difference between the two. And of course, I mean, how famous was I before the internet? Right, right. I mean, how many people want to pay me, right? Not many. They'll pay me to stay away, but they don't pay me to come. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's true. That's true. He's, he's in the non-internet world, and he wants to actually reach people. Yeah. That's pretty tough. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, that having been said, though, the 70s were a fairly fertile time in terms of psychology, right? This is when a lot of the, um, so the, the first round of self-help books were coming out in the 60s and 70s, the uh, Euronia Zones and all those kinds of things, right? And uh, Leo Buscalia was, uh, was uh, starting out. Well, actually, he was, got quite a bit of uh, notoriety. And so there was, you know, if he, if there was potential to, to go from the political, minarchist, Miesian, libertarian world more into the psychology world. But that would have been, that would have been a tough leap for sure. And it would have put him smack dab against the objectivists who had a pretty hideous revolt against psychology with the Brandon split. Yeah, I, was, I was familiar with making those points in, what, the, the 60s, 70s? So. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, of course, uh, Freud was making them. Um, he said that religion was, you know, a psychological problem of, of immaturity uh, and that went all the way back to the womb and, and early feelings of the sort of oneness with the universe is the oneness with the mother that's never been, that people are always trying to get back to. So... Uh, it's certainly been around for, you know, at least 130, 140 years. Um, so it, it wasn't impossible, but it would have meant a pretty radical break. I mean, I think we can see um, how resolutely anti-psychological a lot of libertarians are. Yes. Interestingly, he does actually mention um, in this book, I noticed that he mentioned Thomas Satz, the psychologist. Mm-hmm. And- I think he mentions it purely from a perspective of, you know, he's a libertarian who's helped people free themselves from involuntary servitude in psychological institutions, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Which, and and I know, like, but definitely there were a whole bunch of of pretty rough, like, the, the, the whole, the medical profession in dealing with psychological problems in, like, the 50s and 60s, there was still some, some really hardcore punitive regimes in many of the um uh of the uh, uh, mental health institutes that presumably this guy i haven't read any of his books but presumably this guy was talking about but what i'm saying is uh rothbard was a man who was widely read he would have read about whatever was going on in the day and he picked up on the things that were anti-state in the sense of saying you know the state has mental health institutes that are that are um that star um punitive and damaging to people, but he didn't pick up on, in a sense, the other side of the psychology um, field, which is looking at what leads people to have particular outlooks and, and, uh, and defenses and so forth. Well, and this, this comes to, to, I think, the essential question. So, so the question to me is always, uh, is, it, is it a game for people? Is it, like a, a, is, it, is, it, is it funsies? Is it a show? Or is it, is it real? 
And uh, with Rothbard, I've never quite got the sense that it was real. Uh, and, and the reason that I say that is that, I mean, he lived into his 70s, right? Uh, I think he died in the late 80s, early 90s? Yeah, early 90s. Early 90s, right? So, so uh, Atlas Shrugged was published in 57. So let's say he was still doing intellectual stuff in 87, which is, I think, true. So he's got a 30-year span, right? And to me, the way that I try and figure out whether somebody's just running a racket or whether they're seriously interested in promoting freedom is, do they adapt to failure? Do they change based on failure? Because that's what he preaches as an economist all the time, right? It's the creative destruction of capitalism that if, if firms don't achieve their stated goals of getting customers and, and raising a profit, then they need to change, right? And obsolete industries should die off and there should be dynamism and, and so on, right? So uh, he preaches in the free market that uh, failure is essential and uh, human beings need to adapt to failure, right? So the carriage makers needed to become um, assembly line workers at the Ford plant, right? And, and all that, right? So, so he constantly preaches to people the need to, to adapt, and the one thing that is depressingly the same about libertarianism since its inception is it simply does not adapt to failure, which is a, is a huge puzzle. Right? Particularly, I mean, I can understand communists not adapting to failure because they don't preach adaptation to failure, right? <laughs> I mean, because they're not free marketers, right? But the free market theoreticians are always preaching adaptation to failure, and they simply won't do it with their own philosophy, which seems to me to indicate that it's a kind of it's a kind of racket like it's not really serious it's just a gig right right yeah that's a really interesting point and you know it's interesting that you say that because one of the things that um we were talking about also is like the the the, the juicy stuff in this book is the kind of principle stuff discussion that he goes through but there's also a whole lot of 1970s political gossip and he's sort of saying, you know, oh, well, Watergate is going to mean that people will, like, now they don't believe in the state so much. And isn't it exciting that the Libertarian Party has just done this, that, and the other, and they've got these votes, and it's all going to look good. It's going to be really any day now, basically. Right, right, right. Up. Any day now, right. And, right. and then I remember there is a, an article, like another Rothbard article, I remember uh, reading or hearing on Mises or something, and he makes reference to Newt Gingrich's early 1990s, like some... I the contract I with America, and it's now, yeah. it's right. Yeah. yeah, and he's saying, wow, look at this, any day now, you know, this is all looking good, any day now, right? And yeah. I remember at the time, because I remember when I heard that, I was thinking, I don't know what happened in America, but nothing happened. And he's saying, <laughs> any, right. he's saying like, any day now, this is big stuff. And I, I just like, because I, I would have heard this in maybe 2000 and or 2006, and I remember thinking, well, whatever that was, nothing came of it, right? <laughs> right. And, and, and he was saying this shit in the 70s, and he was saying it in the early 90s. Oh, no, he was saying it in the 60s, too, because when he joined with the, the left, right? Right. And he, he joined with the left so that they could, right, he joined with the Marxists and the left so that they could achieve electoral success, and right? Yeah, because he was saying the anti-Vietnam movement is going to, you know, really take off to be an anti-state movement let's let's rock and roll with these guys and then we'll you know any like first any of all, day yeah. Any, yeah any day now exactly and i guarantee right. you right. he would have been saying any day now with the ron paul success well as his as his followers are right exactly exactly and by success i just mean popularity right right so that and that is the snake oil right the snake oil is, it hasn't worked a hundred times in the past, but trust me, this time, and with no reference, right? A hundred times they say, this is the time, and then it's not the time, and they simply will say 101 with no reference back to the past, right? right I mean, like they won't that, say... that, is, that is statism, right? Right. Because they're, they're in a protected field, and it's either protected through academia or it's protected through the exploitation of children, which is Christianity, right? E either way, they're subsidized through an injustice, through a predation, right? And so, like all protected industries, they don't change. They don't review errors. Why? Because they're not in the market. And so it's a, it's a, but the only way they get to keep getting the money is to say, uh, this time, with no reference to all the previous failures and no change. Because what is the purpose? The purpose is to get the money. There can't be, because that's the one constant, right? Whenever you see someone doing a hundred, uh, they do the same thing a hundred times and they get the same result. Well, that's the result. 
that they want, obviously, right? And so the, 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 it, it, it has to be about it's a gig. Because it, 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 it's the one thing that's constant is they keep getting the money, right? By making the same promises, that's, that's the snake oil side of it. At least that's the theory that I'm working with. I'm not saying it's you know, 150% for sure, but I can't think of any other way to explain just this amazing inability to process failure. Because it can't be failure, right? It can't be failure for them. And so they must be succeeding at something else. And what they're succeeding at is having a gig, right? The thing is that because libertarianism actually, you know, and, or, or let's say, to be clear, because anarchism, you know, in principle, is logically consistent, then if you like debating people, you can, you can totally, you know, use it as a fun tool for basically running rings around people intellectually, right? If you talk to um, statist e um, economists and so forth, like I'm sure Walter Block um, enjoys writing articles saying um, this statist economist is talking a load of rubbish because X, Y, Z, right? Yeah. And in the sense so does it for a living. Right, right. Sorry, who? Again, yeah, help, help. Right, right, and it's a big part of what Peter Schiff does. He debates status, and it's a big part of what Harry Brown did, is that they debate status. So, yeah, you can kick a status ass, for sure. And I think that's what um, Murray Rothbard probably, that's what the gig was for him, was like, hey, look at how clever I am and how uh, logically inconsistent all these other guys are. Well, I think that's maybe true psychologically, but, but the gig is much more pra practical, right? Which is words and income, right? Well, I know what you mean, but then again, it seems that Murray Rothbard put himself really far outside. You know, if it was, if it was about the income, then he had a bit of a crap strategy because he ended up in, in uh, you know, I don't know, in the University of Las Vegas, right? But, but he, might, he might not have been very good at playing the game, right? I mean, that may be the best that you can do, just to be a big fish in a little pond. Right. I mean, it's a possibility. I don't know. I, I never talked to the guy, and people I've talked to said he was sort of very inspirational and so on. But, uh, uh, but it just, just because somebody doesn't end up running Harvard doesn't mean that uh, it's still not for the money. I think that there is an argument from morality there, though, that they would look upon themselves. First of all, I think what they probably want to do is combine getting a comfy academic life with thinking to themselves, look at all this cool stuff that I'm doing to make the world a better place. Right. Yeah, I, for sure. And there, there is a bent that way. They are interested in that kind of stuff, right? But, but it, you know, the, the, the challenge is always... Why are they not interested in analyzing failure? Why is there this incredible paucity of self-criticism in a movement that is all about the dynamic and self-critical marketplace, right? Yeah. And it's got to be because, because they have different customers, right? They have customers who they are satisfying, just like any snake oil salesman, right? The, 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 the real customers, the customers I'm focused on, obviously, it's as current donators because I've got to eat, but the people I'm really focused on are the people of the future, right? My customers are, you know... I think maybe our customers, but certainly my customers are three generations from now. That they're the people that I really need to benefit. And I, you know, not, uh, you know, and, and for me, you all nice donators are just a way of, of getting that. I mean, hopefully you get benefit out of it too, but it's a way of leveraging the world, which is why I'm very concerned and interested in whether I'm succeeding or failing in what it is that I'm doing. And that's why it's always empirical. That's why we deal with personal relationships, because that's empirical, whereas politics is resolutely anti-empirical. You can make up whatever you want. We spent $20 million on the Ron Paul campaign. I'm sure we advanced the liberty for uh, the liberty a cause. It's like, well, how do you know, right? But at least with personal relationships, you, you know, right? If you've got better improved personal relationships, if your marriage is better, if you've got bad people out of your life, you know, that's empirical, that's testable. And that's, uh, I think, what I'm most in interested in. Because it's always fascinating to me that I couldn't get libertarians on my show for years, right? And I then had to go outside the libertarian circles completely uh, to, to get people to start being uh, willing to be interviewed on, uh, uh, on my show. And that's, you know, that's just an interesting fact to process, right? This book and Rothbard's writings and his work have been around for 40 years. 
So if you were to apply the same standard to him that we applied to the uh, movement around uh, Ron Paul, I think that makes him a profoundly um, worse failure than Ron Paul ever, ever will be. Well, I think so. Uh, and certainly, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think so. And, and the failure is not that he didn't succeed in his goals, right? Because that, that's, not, that's not up to us, right? Fundamentally, it's up to the integrity of the world as a whole. To me, Rothbard's failure is not that he did not achieve a, a big movement or he did not solve the problem of how to decrease the power of the state. He didn't live uh, his values. Yeah, the, the failure is that he was not self-critical. Like, he never said to himself, why have we failed? Like, my friend, uh, a friend of mine who's this economist, uh, met him in the 80s and said that, you know, he was really happy and he was really, um, you know, thrilled and, and exuberant and giggled a lot and so on. And I don't know, I'm not saying that we have to hang our heads, but if I get into my 70s and... I have not achieved anything that I set out for 40 years ago. In fact, things are way worse. And if the vast majority of my predictions have been completely and thoroughly refuted and, and, and destroyed, you know, I, I would consider myself honor bound to, uh, to write down the mistakes that I've made, to explore alternative courses, to figure out so that, so that even if I had failed with most of my goals, at least I would provide landmarks for other people not to replicate my mistakes. That, that, to me, would be the honorable thing to do. Uh, and uh, uh, he didn't uh, even come close to doing that. And, and if there was, to Jake's point, if there was things that he couldn't publish because of the environment, why not write them privately and have them released after his death? What was his goal with this book? Well, I would assume that the goal is to move towards a free society, which he felt, as Charles Murray did, and I'm trying to get in touch with Charles Murray because I really want to interview him and say, look, you wrote this book 20 years ago. You said we're probably going to be there in about 20 years. Dude, <laughs> you know, more, more, what's more the story? Yeah, more specifically, um, was his goal the advancement of the Libertarian Party? Was it the elimination of the state? Was it uh, um, some combination of the two um, in, in sort of some bizarre contradiction of the, themselves? Because, uh, I mean, you can't do both, right? Um, no, we know, so we know what his goal was, though, Greg, because his goal was what he achieved. I mean, that has to be the fact, because we're empiricists, right? So we don't have to speculate about what his goal was. No, what his goal empirically was, right? But what was his stated goal? What his stated goal was to free the world, right? But but his real goal is is easy to to understand, right? It was to it was to have a gig, right? Because that's what he did. He continued to teach. He continued to write. He liked to write. Uh, I think he was a good writer, uh, and he liked to teach. And he was a good teacher. And he got a gig. And uh, he was um, he was a big fish in a little pond. And that's what he liked. But didn't have anything to do with actually freeing the world. That's that's just a story you have to tell in order to get the gig, right? It's like the Ron Paul thing, right? You know, I still, I think still though, even though, you know, we read these psychology books and they have great insights into family relationships and so forth, and then they miss some key fundamental points and they always like have this last chapter, which is, oh yeah, and let's apply these principles to the wider world and wouldn't it be nice if nations were more you know, negotiated with each other and all of this kind of stuff that, that for example, was in the, um, in the, um, the book on uh, becoming a person. Um, and, but still, there are some, there are some good things in, in those books, even though they are um, fundamentally uh, flawed. And I think also this book, um, even though uh, was, it is, even though Rothbard himself did have this fundamental flaw. I'm glad that, uh, that he was writing because I found it incredibly useful to read many of the things that he wrote on, on principle, um, even though I understand that, you know, the guy was flawed. Sure, and, and it's, a, it's a big sign that says, Don't, this isn't going to work. And that's really useful to me.
right? I mean, yeah, if I absolutely. hadn't seen so many libertarians and if I hadn't seen the objectivists so completely and catastrophically fail to achieve their goals, we'd be, I would be tempted to, to do the same thing, right? Yeah, like you were saying earlier, Jay Cray, like, yeah. thanks for doing that because now we don't have to. Yeah, exactly, because there's no way that I'm going to write sort of anarchism in a sense as well as Rothbard probably. So at least, like, we know that it wasn't – he's a very good writer. He's very persuasive. So the fact that the guy was spending 40 years pissing around with all of these Libertarian Party shenanigans shows us, like, great, he's done it. It doesn't work. And it was a complete failure. So – Thanks very much. Like that, we can tick that one off. That's a complete dead end. Right, and it's like I'm I'm not going to write a, a better novel about freedom than Atlas Shrugged. So, and Atlas Shrugged completely failed. So, I don't you know. Uh, that's right. It's just about eliminating these things until you get to something yeah. that that is going to work, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that we can tick off the novel writing, and we can tick off the um, politicking. You know, and we can tick yeah. off being an academic, and we can tick off writing entertaining and engaging books about uh, about uh, market capitalism, uh, and and we can do all of the. We just tick those things aren't going to work. They aren't going to work. And eventually, you just get backed into a corner, and in that corner is a big mirror, right? And then you're right, like, exactly. oh, shit. It's, maybe it's up to exactly. me, right? You're absolutely right. It's like, okay, so basically, there's no avoiding your own personal life. You're just going to have to get on with looking at what your your own relationships are. Right, right. There is no eloquence like experience, right? And so I just have to experience this freedom, and uh, then uh, then it will be persuasive to others. Somebody just uh, said, how will you measure and review if you're not failing right now, if your customers are three generations from now? Well, because uh, it's all about the parenting, right? It's all about the family. It's all about the parenting. That's how the world is going to become free. And uh, I can measure that certainly in my own life. My own parenting is much, much, much better because my crap parents aren't in my life and my sibling, crap sibling isn't in my life. So I have uh, a much, much better parenting experience. Uh, you know, I married the right woman and we worked everything out before we had kids. And so our parenting is in sync. And uh, so, so that's definitely working. You know, I'm contributing one example of, of uh, hopefully to continue good parenting uh, to the world. And that's going to give me, I think, um, the opportunity to write a book on, on parenting or at least do some podcast, more podcasts on parenting. Uh, I know that um, uh, people have actually gotten uh, tyrannical or destructive people out of their lives. Uh, and, you know, that hasn't occurred with the Ron Paul people at all. Uh, in fact, they've just substituted one nail-biting, inducing tyranny uh, for another and probably ended up with both. So uh, so the way that I know is that uh, I, can, I can measure it, right? I can measure the degree to which uh, people are getting uh, bad people out of their lives or at least improving their relationships with the people where those relationships can be improved to the point where they're able to be free uh, freely expressed, right? Like everybody wants uh, a society with no censorship, right? Oh, no censorship. But how many people are free to speak at a family dinner? Uh, uh, the thoughts and feelings that are actually going on in their head. Like right. to hell with political censorship. How about just no censorship in my life? Uh, that's where the real censorship, the real lifting of censorship is going to occur. That's measurable, right? Uh, fighting for a, a relaxation of censorship politically you know, how, how do you measure whether you're succeeding or not? Well, whether or not a law gets passed and whether it sticks. And, of course, it's never going to happen because it's not what the state is for. And, uh, but you can measure the stuff that's in your personal life. And that's why, as a sort of rigid imperialist, that's the, uh, empiricist, that's where I continue huh. to go back to. Well, it, most of those political issues really are just – they're just they're – just, um, they're proxies. They're projections, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's got nothing to do with actually freeing the world because – you know, as I sort of was writing in uh, uh, How to Achieve Freedom, like if there's a man, if a man is going south and he says all I want to go, do is go north, and you say, hey, you're heading south, and he's like, I'm, I'm going south. And you say, sorry, he says he's going south, and he's, he says he wants to go north. And you say, hey, you're going south. He's like, I'm going north, and he keeps walking, and you give him a compass that says, hey, you're actually going south. And he throws it aside and says, I'm going north, right? At some point, you're going to get that he, he really doesn't want to go north. He only wants to go south. And he's just saying he wants to go north. And uh, that's sort of where, where I got to with, uh, with libertarianism and with objectivism, which is that uh, it's just it's – a, it's, a, it's a game, right? It's, it's, not, it's not real in terms of, of an actual opposition to tyranny or a pursuit of, of liberty. It's, uh, it's just what they say. It's a gig. So it is, it is frustrating uh, to me that uh, even with all of the stuff that was going on psychologically – throughout the, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, uh, that uh, there was just such a resolute ignoring 
of uh, uh, of all of this stuff uh, that that was going on, uh, and and uh, just a resolute avoidance of childhood, uh, as if we all just sort of pop into existence as calmly rational beings in our in our twenties or something, uh, and that to me is just so anti-empirical that. Uh, I'm always a little bit um, cautious when I'm reading uh, people who ignore childhood or who uh, who are only speaking about adult reasoning capacities and who have never, throughout the course of their life, seemed to notice that uh, people uh, people do not act in an empirically rational manner. They act in a rational manner if you understand sort of defenses and childhood scarring and so on, but they don't act in a logical or an empirically rational manner. And people who've avoided that when they claim to want to, I mean, sorry, let me just rephrase this in a way that's simpler and shorter. The degree to which thinkers ignore uh, childhood and its effects on the psyche uh, and then say they want to reform society is exactly the same to me as, uh, as communists or socialists who uh, ignore the workings of the free market and say they want to optimize economics. Uh, it just it can't be done, and it's just a kind of scam. Right. Just to clarify one point, uh, Steph, when you say your customers are three generations away, I think, like, what I understand from that is that what you're saying is that the people who will actually feel the, um, the, the, the real benefits to, uh, of what it is that you're trying to do are three generations away, because that, logically, your customers are always going to be people who you have some direct interaction with. So in a sense, you are talking to the people and, and, and interacting with the people and getting donations from the people who are around now. It's just what I understand from it is that for all of us who are making the transition, there's quite a lot of pretty hard fucking work that goes along with it. And in mm-hmm. three generations, you know, it's going to be a lot more like, hey, I'm glad I live in a world now where, you know, my parents and their parents had some, some better ideas about raising me type of thing. Is that what you mean? Well, I, it, this question comes up a lot, and I think it's a great question. Whenever I talk about the future, people are like, well, wait a minute. We don't want to be altruists, right? I mean, uh, you know, me, what, right? yeah, what's in it for me? And, uh, but the beauty of it is that uh, unless we're happy, it's not going to work in the future, right? Yes, absolutely. But in that sense, you know, why are you saying your customers are three generations down the line? Because surely you're trying to make people happy now is that also is the way forward, so to speak. Well, because I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive. So, for instance, um, uh, because I have a daughter, uh, I want her to grow up in a world that's not going to be a tyranny, right? And so there are the larger aspects, uh, larger than the personal, though not deeper than the personal, right? Which is all the, the, the DRO stuff and the practical anarchy and the everyday anarchy and the arguments for a state of society, the opposition to war and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's, that's for the future, right? Obviously, uh, talking about DRO theory is not going to, uh, shift one cop on the beat in the in the present world. So we all understand that 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 is uh, we, we're not going to live to see that, but that is uh, that is the roadmap for the future, right? So other people are going to inherit that, and that's the world that we want. But then the question is, how do we get there? Will we get there through self actualization, through honesty about our own histories, through exhorting people into better parenting, and uh, you know, uh, if, you know, get it good or get it gone in terms of relationships? Um, so uh, to me. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. I can't satisfy the customers three generations from now if uh, I'm not sort of, quote, satisfying the customers in the present. The two are kind of the same, but the bigger aspect of what we're talking about in terms of reforming society uh, is a multi-generational project, is in the future, but we can't get there uh, unless we uh, achieve, you know, sort of great happiness and power within our own personal lives in the present. Yeah, and I mean, that's always been, for me, one of the most exciting things about the difference between your approach to libertarianism, so to speak, is that it is to say, look, you know, you focus, you can focus on, like, the Fed, which you're not going to have any impact on, and who knows whether or not in two generations, you know, you're going to get some kind of gold standard or something like that, or you can focus on the actual life that is happening right now, your actual life right now, right? And your real personal relationships, the tangible things that you could see change in. And that, to me, you know, I, when you say I'm like looking at three generations down the line as my customers, I guess partly because, you see, I grew up in a communist family and I was told that, you know, in three generations down the line, we'll have the revolution and everyone will be 
you know, happy in the, the, the world to be this better place. Even oh, and if, we sacrifice now for that exactly. down the road. Exactly. We're going to sacrifice yeah, yeah, yeah. now for this great future that's... In a sense, that's the, the, the religious argument, too. It's like, you know, you might feel like shit, but when you're dead, it's going to be great type of thing. And right. No, and I agree with you that, but I don't. I don't see the two as, as in any way oppos- opposing. Like we don't sacrifice our happiness now for the sake of people in the future. In fact, if we sacrifice our happiness now, the people in the future won't be free. Like, right. The, the absolutely. Two one of the same. Yeah. And and I completely understand that. I was just saying, like in a sense, you. I, I think one has to be slightly careful about the context of the argument you're making about three generations down the line, because it could be misinterpreted in that way. You mean in terms of we sacrifice now to save the unborn? Yeah, people people might think you're saying like what you're saying that you're really just working for these guys in the future, and I have to tough it oh, out. Oh, I get that. I get that. Anytime people come across the future arguments, and I think it, you're right, it's a hangover of the sort of uh, the paradise to come of religion and perhaps communism or certain kinds of socialism that we sacrifice now. And also, I guess it's like some of the. Um, uh, some of the bad parent stuff, you know, like uh, I sacrificed everything for you, <laughs> you know, like uh, this idea that sorry. we sacrifice for the future and all that. And no, I, I certainly don't. I, I don't feel that I have um, uh, made any fundamental sacrifices for the future. I mean, I'm much happier now than when when I started Free Domain Radio. And uh, I know and that's not to say it's consistent or whatever. And sometimes it does feel like a pretty freaking heavy load to bear. But uh, for the most part, I haven't found it to be any kind of fundamental sacrifice. Like I'm not sitting here going, man, oh, man, I'd love to be back doing another software presentation in Anchorage, Alaska. But you know, I guess I'll just <laughs> well, find some way to be happy with these powerful the conversations about philosophy. Right. I mean, uh, it, quite the opposite. This is an essential point, though. I mean, we shouldn't overlook it. Is that um, uh, that misery begets misery, and that um, <coughs> joy begets joy, right? <coughs> like, for, if someone tells you that you have to suffer now to save the children of the future, you know they're lying because suffering only begets suffering. Right. Yeah. Right. Except, and this is a tricky one that we have to to tackle, which I think is an important point to make, is that, you know, when you first start out dealing with your bad relationships and your own defenses, oh, man, it feels like shit. I mean, it really does. (laughs) But so does quitting heroin, right? But we understand it's just a good thing to do. right? Right. So, you know... Right, and in that case, there are tangible benefits that you get very, maybe not very soon, but uh, quickly enough yeah. after after working on it, right? And Steph's always been very upfront about that as well. So, but I just think like you, you the you know, oh, uh, suffering only begets suffering, and so forth. I mean, that's true. But on the other hand, sometimes making a tough decision actually does involve, you know feeling pretty rough for a while before you experience the benefits from it and uh giving up heroin i'm sure um although i haven't experienced it i would imagine is uh, is the same thing hmm. and of course if if everything that was good felt good we wouldn't need philosophy just like we yeah, wouldn't need nutrition if everything that philosophy. tasted good was good for you right right yeah you would just do whatever felt like the most easiest and good in the moment right right <clears throat> 